All right. Good morning, everybody. Would you please rise and sing with us this morning? Oh, okay. Father, we just come to you this morning. We just want to praise you and lift your name on high. We just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity that we have to gather in your name this morning freely. Lord, I ask that you would open our hearts and our minds this morning to hear what you have for us from your word. Lord, would you also come and inhabit our praise this morning. In your name I pray, amen. Sickness 
few missional church this morning. Uh, if you're a first-time visitor, we don't call you out. We don't have greeters at the door. But when we begin to say hello to each other this morning, let somebody know it's your first time here because we like to give you a coffee mug. It's a nice travel mug, so it's worth letting somebody know. Um, just let them know, and they will put that in your hands. And we want to welcome you and greet you here today. And at this time, the little guys can head to Children's Church, and the rest of us can say hello. Father, thank you today that we have this privilege of being here together. Thank you, God, just for the joy of fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for uh, the opportunities just to sing of your worth and your praise, to reflect on your goodness through this week, and, and to just 
put before you our needs and requests. But God, we thank you also that we, you have given us your word and that we can sit down and we can open your word and we can be instructed by it. We can be uh, challenged by the truth of your word and uh, Lord, hopefully brought into uh, to conform with the truth of your word. And so as we come to that moment in this service, Lord, just prepare our hearts for that. Um, make us attentive to the truth of your word and, and God, just do in us whatever needs done today. Uh, we thank you. We look forward to this time. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We are, uh, are on, a, on a trip through the, uh, through the Psalms of the Ascension, the Songs of the Ascension, uh, as they're sometimes referred to, uh, this group of Psalms, 15 Psalms, and in, in towards the end of the book of Psalms. And, and I've enjoyed, I've been challenged by it, I've enjoyed the journey through, and we are up to the ninth <clears throat> of 15 Psalms. We're going to finish it up uh, on Christmas Day. Uh, but it's this, this group of songs that the Jewish pilgrims, as they would travel to the festivals each year, three different festivals that they would travel to, that they would be sung along the way. They were a, a part of that journey. And it's a, they're progressive in nature. They begin at home and, and they uh, progress till the time that they arrive in, in Jerusalem for the festivals. And, and in the same way, they, they reflect great truth to us in the progression of our journey, our, our faith journey, and we've been looking at it through that, that perspective. And, and part of, of, of what we see in the, the Psalms of the Ascension isn't simply um, uh, personal in the sense that the, the Jewish pilgrim was, was, was looking for help in their life and the things that they were struggling with. Personally, there was also this corporate sense that, that comes back over and over and, and in it a concern for the nation. That not only are they, they concerned for themselves and their family, they're, they're not simply concerned for, to bring God to glory uh, through their own life and their own family. They're, they're thinking, in a sense, the nation that we live in, Israel. And, and multiple times through the Songs of the Ascension, that comes up, this concern for Israel, the nation. And, and so we're going to look at it today from that perspective for us, the nation. Not the nation of Israel, but, but the truth that can be found for us and, and our nation today. In, here in, in, in the United States uh, of America. You know, this past week, last Sunday, uh, just a horrific tragedy in, in Texas where a, 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 just an insane, godless person goes into a church of all places and just begins to fire and, and kill 26 people, 12 children. And there is something seriously wrong with that. And, and so we look at that, and we, we try to come up with answers, and we try to come up with understanding. Why would somebody do that? And, and what is happening in our nation is this. There was a time when, when tragedy struck, when, when something bad happened to the nation as a whole, something that was horrific. We, it was a moment when we seemed to gather together. Then it, it pulled us together, and we, and, and we battled against that. Today, I was talking to Mike Parana before the service, and he was showing me pictures and telling me about his family who, who was rooted in, in the history of World War II and, and, and the way that they as a people gathered together and, and fought against the evil of the world. And yet what happens in our culture today, it seems, is this. When something like this happens, instead of us being unified, instead of us, us gathering together and battling and fighting back against something as horrific as this, we, we go to our respective corners. We... We, we have a way that we think needs, this needs to play out. And we begin to battle for our point of view, our perspective. And so what ha has to happen, this is what's going to happen. And what ends up, instead of this unified collection of people ready to battle against the evil in this world, we're, we're fractured, we're split, we're shattered. And, and that is our nation today. We are, we are so fractured and, and, and divided in so many ways and, and, and we, we, we want to know an answer. In fact, here's what we will often do as Christians. This will be our prayer. God, bless America. God, God, and, and we'll say that maybe as a, as, as, a, as a prayer request. Maybe we'll sing it in a song. We'll maybe even not so much ask it as demand it. That, that God needs to bless America. And, and there is a truth that we need the blessing of God. But here when we ask that 
For that, here's what we're usually asking. When we say, God bless America, simply what does that mean? It means, God, make good things happen to us. You know, bring, bring good things to our nation. Restore us. Give us unity as a people. Give us hope. Give us jobs. Give us prosperity. We, we think in those very practical terms when we think the blessings of God. But, but what we see throughout Scripture is that so many times the blessings of God aren't simply based on God freely giving, but in us living in some way it, that would warrant blessings from God. And so we're not simply demanding blessings of God based on His grace and His goodness, which all blessings are from His grace and goodness, but, but blessings of God that will come corresponding with lives that we live and choices that we make as a people, as a nation, and as individuals. And so today, as we, as we look at this, this just horrific position that we find ourselves in as a people, and I think we are getting to the point where it's almost, uh, we're almost nonchalant about it. There's, a, there's almost a, 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 a sense that we don't even notice it anymore. And, I, and I'll point this out. I didn't hear a prayer request this morning in any way regarding that that tragedy last week. Now, I don't say that to, to condemn or to, but, but to point out that we have become quite cavalier about this kind of tragedy in our country. And I think it's because we just, we expect it. This is what I expect now. This is, I guess this is the way it's always going to be. And so, and so the question becomes, as a believer, as a Christian, as a church, what, what do we do about it? What can we do about the situation that we find ourselves in today? I, my, my hope is, as we look at this text in, in uh, Psalm 128 today, that we will maybe have some sense of how that is going to happen. I want to start with this verse from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And it was a verse, it, this has to do with the, uh, uh, Israel and, and their desire, their need to, to uh, experience the blessings of God. And so 2 Chronicles chapter 7 uh, says this, if my people, now he's talking about Israel, he's talking about Jerusalem. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Now, understand that. We will just simply say this prayer, God bless America, God bless my family, God bless me. Whatever request that we're making, we're making it simply upon the grace of God. God, do this for me. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. But look what God says in this verse. He says, if, if this happens, now he doesn't use the term blessing here, but I think it's obvious in the text, that blessing comes as a result of a repentant people, a humble people, a people who, who seek God. And in that, he says this, I'm going to forgive their sin and I'm going to heal their land. And I think as we begin this to look at Psalm 128, we need to think of it in this term, in this term. Psalm 128 is practically what needs to happen for this to happen in our lives as, as Americans, our, our lives as, as believers and Christians. And what we're going to do when we look at here at Psalm 128 today, we're going to start with the end and work back to the beginning. What I mean is this. When you get to the end of Psalm 128, there's this sense that of blessing, of healing in the nation. And so, and so what we need to do is understanding that's where we're headed. Look at that and then go back to the beginning. We, if we want to get to here, let's go back and see where it starts. Because there's this progressive sense in this text where we begin here and this is where we end up. John Wesley is the, the founder of, of Methodism and the Methodist Church. And, and they're called Methodists for this reason, if you didn't know that, they're, because they were practical. They did things methodically. And so when they thought about what's it going to take to, to live a, a godly life, what, what, how do I live holy, they, he would practically lay out, here's the things you need to do. That kind of resonates with me. I like, I like practical steps. This is what you need to do if this is going to happen. And we're going to look at that today. John Wesley, anyway, he said, he said this, and, and he, he developed these uh, kind of uh, steps of the faith. And, and he said this uh, 
regarding that. And I lost it. I had it up here and I lost it. John Wesley said, in, in every action, reflect on your end. In every action, reflect on your end. Whatever it is that you're going to do, think about where it is you want to end up. If, if, if this is something you want, if there's some place you want to be, then you need to think about that before you start what you're doing. And so as we as a Christians, to, as Christians and as Americans today, look at our country and we think, oh my goodness, this is, this is just hopeless, this is horrible. We need to reflect on where it is we want to be. Where is it that, that God wants us to be? Where it is, is it that we want to be? Before we can take the first step, we need to understand where we're headed. If, if we begin this journey aimlessly without really an understanding of where it is that we're going to end up, we're never going to get there. We will wander around hoping that we bump into that place that, that it is that we want to be. But we begin understanding where it is that we desire to end up. John Paul II said this, and, and this is going to be the foundation really of our message today. He said this, he said, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the world in which we live. Years ago, I was at a, I think it was a Promise Keepers event, and, and Pastor Tony Evans was speaking. And he talked about the fact that we, that we look at this messed up world. But he said this, he said, messed up families make messed up communities. Messed up communities make messed up states. Messed up states make messed up nations. Messed up nations make messed up worlds. And I'm paraphrasing. I don't remember his exact words on it. But, but the point is this, that, that the transformation of this world is not going to begin in Washington, D.C. or the United Nations. It is actually going to begin in your home. It's going to begin in the, in the homes of, 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 of godly people who are, who are going to do their part to change the world by changing that, th their home, by changing their family. And that's the Psalm 128 is this continuation of what we looked at in Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those that, that labor, labor in vain. And unless God is involved in this, this is a pointless effort. And so we can look at all the crap that's going on, if I can say that from the pulpit, we can look at all the junk that's going on in the world today, and we can come up with all kinds of ideas, sociologically, politically. But here's the thing. We are not dealing, we are dealing with a spiritual problem. A spiritual problem that is addressed sociologically is pointless. A spiritual problem that's addressed politically Pointless. It is, like, it is like there's this gash, this huge wound, and we're throwing a Band-Aid on it. And, and so any answer that we might have to a problem that is simply has to do with a law, changing laws, something that has to do with, with, with uh, psychological treatment, I don't know, all of that is simply a Band-Aid on a horrible gaping wound. And the only way that we're truly going to address these deep spiritual problems that are affecting our nation and the world is, is, is what we looked at here in the beginning from the book of 2 Chronicles. And so let's jump into Psalm 128 and, and take a look at, at what I believe is the answer to experiencing healing in America, healing in our, in our land. Psalm 128, beginning at, at verse 1, says this, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in His ways. I'm going to read the whole way through this, and then we're going to come back to the beginning. Verse 2, You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Verse 3, Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your sons will be like olive shoots around your table. Thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion all the days of your life. And may you see the prosperity of Jerusalem, the nation. Verse 6, and may you live to see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. See where it ends up. We start looking to where it is that we're going. Where does it end up? It ends up with prosperity in Jerusalem. And I'm looking at my grandkids. I'm looking at that those who are coming after me, those who are going to follow me. That's where we want to end up. 
But we have to go back to the beginning. We have to go back to the beginning to get to the end. So back to verse 1 there, Travis. Blessed are all who fear the Lord. Here's where it begins. Here's the start. This is where every healing that's going to happen in terms of our nation begins is the fear of the Lord. Having a, a true comprehension and understanding of who God is and what, it, and, what, and what we're like. Because if we don't get to that point, if we don't understand that, there is no point in even trying to take another step. We're not going to experience healing in this land until we truly understand our character and God's character, who God is. And, and this sense of fear. Now, we, we've kind of minimized that, but, but let's be honest about it. That if we understand our true sinfulness, if we understand our, our corrupt nature, and we think of that and stand before our holy God, we should be fearful. That should make us quake when we think about that. And if we are going to experience just a, a revival and a blessing in this nation, we better understand that. We, you, you better get it and understand who you are compared to who God is. Und knowing and understanding God, the, the, the whole idea of moving and experiencing healing in our nation begins when we as individuals seek to know and understand who God is. It's, it begins with you. We can look at this nation and we can blame everybody else and we can look at all the problems and we can point fingers, but, but the only way that we're going to do anything about this is when we as individual believers recognize the part that we have to play. You know, in, in, my, in my life, my marriage, in my, the, the years that my wife and I have been together, there have been times when we've been confronted with challenges. Every marriage has some challenges, Right? Sometimes they're financial challenges. Sometimes they're the kids. But, but one of the things that has happened over the years in those challenges is this. There is a temptation when you face a challenge to look across the table, to look at the other person and, and think of how they have contributed to the problem. That the kids have turned out this way because of the way you treat them. The way you are with the kids is why the kids are the way the kids are. Right? Right? And I remember once my wife and I going through a particular difficult time in, in regards to something, and I started that. I started like, you know, it's pretty obvious why this is where it's at. <laughs> and, and you know what she said, you know, she said to me, she said, you know, I can't do this alone. That's what she said. And it, and, it, and it struck me and it stuck with me because what I was doing was I was dividing. I was splitting it. I was saying, this is your responsibility. This, you created this mess is really what I said. And, and, and in that moment, I recognized that, that, okay, this problem we got isn't her problem. This is our problem. And that means the both of us need to sit down and recognize that and, and do what has to be done in order to repair this. And so when we look at our nation, that's what we're doing. That is exactly what we're doing. When something like this happens, we are looking at other people and going, this is because this is, this is of Washington. It's because of our schools because of our churches. We, we come up with all these other, all these reasons, and really, it really begins right here. It begins in my heart with my responsibility. I've contributed to this mess. My, my ability to change the nation is, is primarily through my children. My, my opportunity to share who God is, to, to, to pass that on, is primarily through my family, through my kids. That's the, that is the means that God has chosen, really, to pass that on. And we need to understand personally the part that we are responsible for in this. And it begins when we know and understand who God is. And if we don't get that, we will not move past that. We won't take another step. And the second thing that we see in verse two, or in the rest of verse one, is that out of that fear comes obedience. When I understand who God is, and I understand who I am, when I come to know God and, 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 and have a, a true comprehension of what it means to know and follow God, what comes out of that is obedience. Fear of God brings obedience. And if you want to change the world, you, you want to, to, to heal this nation, then you as an individual need to understand that you must live in obedience to God's word. 
Our nation will be healed. Our land will be healed as we, as followers of Christ, live obediently to the commands of Jesus. We need to do what he told us to do. We need to live in a way that lines up with the word of God. And as individuals, we begin to change the world when we do that. When we simply do what God's word tells us to do, it becomes a, a, a force of change in our, in our world, profoundly impacting our world. And so he even indicates this then, that out of that comes this. Because each of these progress. One leads to the next. When I know and understand who God is, then I can be obedient to God. And when I'm obedient to God, then what comes next? Well, it indicates this idea of being productive, that, that you're going you're gonna to see fruit to your labor. And so as we begin to, to, to begin this process of desiring to see our nation healed and changed, as we, as we know and understand who God is, and as we live obediently, we begin to see, we begin to see fruit. We, we begin to see a result. And, and so instead of looking at this picture and, and, and thinking this is just overwhelming, this is too much for us to even hope to do anything about, I just take the little steps one at a time and I do whatever is in front of me. I, I faithfully do whatever God has given me to do, whatever it might be. And, and you do the same thing. That whatever responsibility that God has given you, do it. In fact, there's a verse that says, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not to man. It means whatever responsibility you have, whatever your job is, whatever responsibility in your home, in your community, you faithfully work at that. Just do whatever it is that God has given you to do. And, and God is going to use that in this progression of bringing healing to our land. Just do whatever it is that God has given you to do. There's, a, there's such a frustration in the church of seeing just a few people doing. God, God wants you plugged in somewhere doing something. How, however insignificant you might think it is, just do something. Just do whatever it is God has given you to do. Faithfully work at it. And, and that begins this continues this process. Our nation is going to be healed as we faithfully work at the task God has put before us, whatever it might be. And, and, and so, when we look at something this big, we think in big terms. We think in terms of a one-time event. God just come down and bless the nation. Turn this around. Fix this mess we've created. And yet, it is created when a million believers simply do whatever it is God has given them to do. Just all these different opportunities we have to love people, to show who Christ is, to serve him in our world, in our community. And, and that leads to this healing that we desire. And then he says this. He begins to speak of the blessing of the marriage. That when we, are, when we are knowing who God is and loving him and living for him and walking obediently and, and doing whatever it is he's put before us, then what comes out of that is this blessed marriage, this great marriage, this awesome marriage. It is a, it is a product. It is a product of living faithfully and loving God. And this is what comes out of it. And so what can you do today? And th th this seems crazy. But when you see the news and your heart's sick over what is going on in the world, and I'd say, what can you do about that? Well, you know, go home and love your wife. Treat, treat your, your spouse with love and respect. Show them who, who Christ is by the way you love them, the way you live in your, in your household. One of the most important things that we can do as, as Christ followers is to, to have godly marriages. To, to build up marriages that are a reflection of who Jesus is, because the Bible says that, that the husband reflects Jesus to the world, that the wife reflects the church, that the way that we love our wives is a reflection of the way that Jesus loved the church, or we should reflect that. 
People should look at our marriages and say, I get it now. I understand. The, the way that he loves his wife, that's how Jesus loved the church. And yet, too many times, even in the church, that's not what people see. And so if you want to change the world, if you want to see our nation to be healed, you need to work at building a strong and godly marriage. Make your marriage a priority. Make your wife a priority. Make your husband a priority. Love and serve them. And, and in that, you are, you are doing what you can do to bring healing to our nation. Now, that seems counterintuitive. That seems to go against what we would think. Because what does, what does me loving my wife have to do with the fact that some maniac went down to Texas and shot up a church? We, it is because it is through that that we change our world one community at a time, one family at a time. And of course, what comes out of that is children. As he begins to talk about what comes out of that strong marriage, he said, and he describes these kids sitting around the table, and he describes them as an olive shoot. Now, kind of an interesting terminology, since we aren't in an olive, olive uh, tree growing community. Maybe we don't understand it. But he, an olive tree is a, a small little plant that can grow to incredible potential and eventually what? Bear fruit, bear olives. And so he describes it in that way, and I think for a very important reason. One is that, that for that olive tree to grow, uh, first of all, there's an incredible potential there. There's an, an, an incredible potential to impact people beyond the current that currently live here. I got trees that I planted when I built my house 40 years ago, or 35 years ago, I guess. And when, I, when we built that house, I planted a little tree. And, and now, now they're 40 feet tall. And, and, and they will grow well beyond that after I'm gone. They, they, will, they will outlive me, that is for sure. And so in that manner, as we have these olive shoots around the table, we have these children that we have an opportunity to impact. We need to look at them and see the incredible potential that exists there. We're not throwing away kids. So we're going we're gonna to love kids and, and do everything we can to see them reach their potential. And, and, and if we are going to impact our world, we need to understand that. That I'm probably going to be long gone before there's any opportunity really to see this nation completely turned around. But you know what? I'm going to do everything I can with those four daughters that I have and those three grandkids I have to see that the world will be changed by them. We, we as a church recently hired an associate pastor, someone who could, have, could really spend time with the youth or children's ministry. Because, because we, want to, we want to send out kids who love God and who want to change the world. And children are... A product of this. And so, as we understand their potential, then what comes next is this. We need to care for them. We need to nurture them. And so, if you want to change the nation, you want to heal the land, then you pour your life into the kids that God has given you. You love them, and you nurture them, and you take care of them. And some days, you are not going to see any growth. Some days it looks like, it looks like a, a little withered stick, doesn't it? But, but you keep loving them and you keep nurturing them and you keep pouring yourself and pouring God into them. And, and someday then you're going to see a fruit in that. We need to pour our lives into our children. We need to, to, to change the world and, and see healing our land by building strong and godly children. Years ago, my wife and I, we would travel down to, the, down to North Carolina every year, and we'd see these, these awesome, um, um, I just lost the word of the trees. What's the trees that get all the blossoms on them? Crepe myrtle, crepe myrtle. Crepe myrtle, we loved crepe myrtle, and we were like, we're going to have a crepe myrtle someday. So one day we were down in North Carolina, we bought a crepe myrtle, and we brought it home, planted it in the ground, and, and uh, it grew for a little while, and all of a sudden it was looking bad. And, and, and finally, it was down to, there was just a little stick. And there was, it was a dead stick. And I was like, I was like, ah, oh, gee whiz. But I kept taking care of it. I kept kind of watering it. 
putting mulch on it, doing what it could to take care of those little crepe myrtle because they don't tend to do real well around here. And it was like, like I said, it was a stick. It was just a dead looking little stick. And I was like ready to quit. And, and one day I went down and I got down and I looked at it and there's this, there's this little piece of green that's coming out down at the bottom. And I'm like, yes, <laughs> yes. And, and of course my wife's like, what, what, what's going on? The crepe myrtle's alive. <laughs> and you know, you know, in, in, I've experienced that as a dad, too. I'm looking at it going, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and then and one day, this, like, this little green shoots out. And it's like, yes! That's why we've been doing this. And I really believe this. I believe that, that, that as a nation, that's, that's where our, our, our hope lies. We, we begin this process by, by fearing and knowing who God is by being obedient to him. And all of these other things just kind of follow along. Now that's not to say that you can't drop the ball. We can't make mistakes with our kids. We can't make mistakes in our marriage. But, but as we faithfully work at these things, pour our lives into these things, I believe this. I believe God will take and heal this land. In fact, I think that's the only hope. Honestly, I don't, I don't believe that there's a, 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 uh, a, a, a politician who's going to come along and fix this. I don't believe it has anything to do with the, the political parties that are, are potential or in power. It has everything to do with you. It has everything to do with us as a people as we, as we fear and know who God is. And, and out of that is going to come a healing. We, we as Christians bear an incredible responsibility in this. We can point at atheists that shoot up churches and that is horrible and and. And he, he has met his maker. But, but really, if we want to change that, it's not about getting rid of them. It, it's about building up the church. It's about making disciples. It's about changing our nation one family at a time. And so um, as we look at this faith journey, we can't ignore this fact that, that we're in a dark place right now as a people, as a, as a nation. I really believe that. And, and we might want to just give up. We might, might want to just quit. We might just resign ourselves to this is the way it's going to be. But I encourage you to, to, to work at your relationship with God, live obediently to him, and love and care for your wife and, and the kids that you have. And I love where this ends up at the end of this text. He's talking about the prosperity of Jerusalem. He's talking about a land that has been healed. And then, and then grandkids. The, the, the beauty then of, of being able to look back and, and see that your life is, is going to impact future generations because, because your grandkids now are going to be your advocate. They're going to be the one that carries on this great hope that comes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I, I thank you. God, in these dark and, and difficult times that God, you give us hope. That, that you give us a, 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 a picture, a, a step to take in order to see healing in our nation. I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't simply leave here looking at somebody else and pointing fingers and, and, and blaming others, but, but looking at our own hearts and our own lives and determining that, God, we're going to take the steps that we need to take in order that this land would be healed. We thank you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved
disappear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free my God my Savior has ransomed me and like a flood His mercy reigns unending love amazing grace the Lord thank you today just for your word thank you God for encouraging us in such a dark time with just the hope of your word and I pray Lord that that we could look at this today and take practical steps in our lives as believers Lord to know you better to live more obediently to you to to work at the the tasks that you've given us to to love our wives and our husbands to love our children to shape them into the godly Christ followers that you want Lord, help us to live in that way and understand this, that, that even in the most darkest and hopeless situations, Lord, we, we serve a God who can overcome any of that. Help us, Lord, in your, in your desire to change the world that we live. We thank you and we pray these things all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.